Okay, so before we get into the actual review, I want to talk a little bit about this cover. This is truly awful. The focus seems to be this grainy 1995 inkjet printout of what I assume is a drunk making his way home from a night out in Glasgow city center. These clouds, I think they were generated on a Spectrum 48K using a prototype 1982 image generator. And this castle is clearly Western Castle, photographed in the late 20th century, even though this book is set in the Second World War. It also bears no relation to the castle presented in text and graphics in the actual book. This recommendation here from the famed literary giants of the Seattle Post Intelligencer, that might carry some weight, but I'm colorblind and I can't make out what it says due to the choices they've made in the colors here. So if you are responsible for this, then you should be fired from a cannon into the sun. A touch harsh? Not really if you consider this. This book was recommended to me on the strength of this iconic cover and I quote, one of my earliest memories as a child is seeing my mother read this book. It must have been the early 80s when I think this book was published. The reason I remember this so well was the cover picture. The book was black with a cross shape and an evil looking face in it. That certainly left an impression on my young child's mind. Well, this ugly splodge will only leave an impression on your backside if you use it for toilet paper. Rant over. Hello and welcome to my review of The Keep by F. Paul Wilson. This book was published in 1981 and is, according to Google, the first in a six-book series called The Adversary Cycle. That said, it functions perfectly adequately as a standalone novel. It's set before the Nazi invasion of Russia, but at the height of German military success in the Second World War. A detachment of soldiers are stationed at an old keep in a pass in the Transylvanian Alps. They've been stationed there in case the German-Russian relationship should turn south. Spoiler alert, it did. Um, so, and while there, the troops will hold the pass from any Russian encroachment and protect the Romanian oil fields. The first 80 pages of this are as tense and gripping as pretty much any horror book you can expect to read. It's not especially grisly, but it is very effective and it raises tension in just the same way as a teen wandering into a basement in any 1990s horror movie would. Almost as soon as the Germans arrive, they're greeted by the standard pitchfork-bearing yokels that normally forewarn a certain doom in these books and are always ignored anyway. The Germans commandeer the keep and fiddle around with stuff best not fiddled with and in doing so unleash a mysterious horror that starts murdering them one by one. They send a communique to high command, it reads, something is murdering my men, and an SS commander, eager to set up a new concentration camp in Romania, is instead diverted to the keep to sort things out. Wilson does a pretty good job of keeping the, the German army and the SS at odds. The SS commander Kempfer is a racist, obviously, a smug, evil coward. This is essentially when we have to care at least some of these Germans getting killed for the book to work. And Kempfer's petty vindictiveness contrasts well with the more honourable Captain Vermin, the leader of the Wehrmacht. I'm sorry. The mystery of the keep, its walls engraved with myriad crosses, the unexplained murders, they all force the Germans to enlist the help of a local historian. That the historian is a Jew complicates matters, that he is crippled by illness and unable to function without his daughter more so. And it's here that the book comes unstuck a little. Another character, Glenn, races from Portugal to Romania, summoned by the unintended release of the murderous spirit of the keep. Such is his haste to arrive in Romania that his total inaction when he does seems a little at odds. He spends a lot of his time sitting in a tree, watching the keep, and attempting to romance the impossibly beautiful Magda, the historian's daughter, who has been exiled from the keep for stirring the loins of the soldiery. Their romance, Wilson's obsession with Magda's breasts, see page 55 for a completely unnecessary example, is as tiresome as the stuff of E.L. James, though less explicit. She hates him because he's arrogant, but she falls in love with him because he makes her tingle. Did I mention I have a review of Fifty Shades of Grey? There's a link in the description. The romantic stuff is overblown and cliched, and not as interesting as the grisly murders or the German infighting, or even the historian's investigation into the folklore. Worse, and there are spoilers coming, I thought it a touch odd that Glenn didn't try to go into the keep. 
Magda knew the secret passage into the keep, so simply by following her, he could have found his way in as well. But it is revealed towards the end of the book that Glenn actually built the keep, so he knew about the secret entrance the whole time. So why didn't he go inside? It would have been dangerous, yes particularly with the excitable German presence, but, but why did Glenn hurry so if the situation wasn't a dire emergency? At the very start, two German soldiers are sent to investigate a part of the keep. They release the spirit that kills one of them. The rest of the soldiers don't know what happened. They do know that two men went into a room and one of them died, yet their suspicion of the other guy, and I'd make him the prime suspect, doesn't go very far. The investigation, if developed further, might have helped with the antagonism between the army and the SS. I can say without any doubt it'd be more interesting than the love story aspects of this book. Wilson's prose is technically solid, as these passages from the unfortunate Private Lutz's Treasure Hunt in the Keep's Catacombs shows. Lutz began to slide forward into the dark chamber, the lamp ahead of him. He was seized by a sense of urgency. He moved as quickly as the confines would allow. By the time his head and shoulders were through the opening, the lamp's flame had dimmed to a tiny blue-white flicker, as if the light were unwelcome, as if the darkness had sent the flame back into the wick. As Lutz advanced the lamp a few more inches, the flame died. With its passing, he realised he was not alone. Or from pages 353 to 354, he heard nothing, felt nothing. As he stood and waited for his eyes to adjust to the darkness, he noted that the noise had grown louder, as if amplified by the absence of light. Utter absence. There was no glow, not even a hint of illumination from around the bend. The scraping noises sounded much louder now, and directly ahead, yet there was no light. No matter how he strained his eyes, he could see nothing. He began to perspire as fear reached deep into his intestines and squeezed. There had to be light somewhere ahead. As you can see, the book plays on standard and common phobias in the same way as James Herbert's The Rats or Levy's Came a Spider, but when the secret of what is lurking in the deadly darkness is revealed, it's a touch disappointing that it turns out to be a sub-emo standard Dracula type. Though it's fairly interesting that Wilson uses this as something of a red herring to introduce his grander schemes, the book functions less well as the stakes get higher. By way of contradicting myself here, there are a few pages where the evil seeps out into the nearby village and causes havoc that are quite nice, but overall I'd say this book works better within the confines of the keep, and the further the stakes are expanded, the less it can utilise the intimacy and claustrophobia they provide. In conclusion, the book is solid, very effectively cranking up the mystery and tension in the early stages, to put that part of the book at least on a par with some of the other horror books I've already mentioned. The middle section is unfortunately a bit of a drag, the love story aspect doesn't work or hold the interest, but told concurrently with the manipulation of the historian by the evil spirit of the keep, it's, it's okay. The monster's great reveal also comes too early and will perhaps disappoint some. The final act is better, but gets a touch bogged down by some pretty lengthy passages of exposition. The magical and mythological aspects introduced here perhaps do not play off as well against the German mechanical efficiency and technology as they might if they were introduced earlier. The March of the Undead, while I'd have liked it to have been longer, more personal perhaps, it is nearly as strong as that entertaining opening, so these two aspects alone make this book worth checking out, especially if you're into these sorts of mythological horror novels that are, I think, a bit more common now than they were back in the 1980s. This is not a genre I read in very much, beyond a handful of Stephen King and James Herbert, I guess, but it was quite enjoyable nonetheless. Well worth checking out if you're into horror of this type. Around this point in the video, it is customary to suggest you like, comment and subscribe. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.